Not all of my new categories have a cool title, but this one does. Economaste, where I talk about economics and finance, but in a way that makes you peaceful inside and makes you feel good about the world and where it's going. Or uh, just exposes some truths that might feel a little bit uncomfortable, and then we do our peaceful healing after. Anyway, let's start. First, the philosophical thought. Tools of progress and tools of conquest are forever intertwined. There is no way to separate the great things you accomplish as a nation or as a people from the horrible things that allowed you to get there. And that includes all of the weapons that have been created. Even now, one of the biggest reasons the world is more peaceful than ever, and you can look this up, is the very existence of the thing that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are an incredible deterrent because everyone knows that it's mutually assured destruction. One drops, the other one drops, and everyone's gone. So that is the great peacemaker of our society. And unfortunately, People had to suffer and pay with their lives in order for that to, to be the case. And there are countless examples of, you know, guns and, and all the things that they brought and all the conquests that they were responsible for. In fact, every single society that conquered had some advantage in weaponry that allowed them to conquer those other people. Now, the people being conquered might have also been contributing to their own self-destruction, like Athens was relishing its own wealth and descending into uh, <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah land. But that's the thing. We have ugly histories, all of us. And even on an individual level, Oprah, as iconic and successful as she is, if you look at her early shows, they're a shit show. <laughs> they're not that different from Jerry Springer. She was doing a lot of very uh, lowbrow, controversial topics. This is back when she was uh, still in her early days in uh, Chicago or only in Chicago before she got syndicated. Everyone has these bad histories. Tony Robbins, another example, he was doing like sort of huckstery type of uh, TV commercials, selling all kinds of, you know, weird infomercial products. These are people who we now think very highly of, who charge a lot of money to celebrities uh, to advise them or get paid a million, sometimes a uh, hundred million a year. We all have a dark past, especially people who reach a certain level. And we should be judged on some level uh, about that, but it doesn't hold up on a multi-generational basis because at the end of the day, you can only control what you can control. And this is our reality. Our reality is one of conquest and it's kind of bloody. And the history of every country that exists today has some dirt on its hands. And the sooner we come to terms with that reality, the sooner we could move on. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of that history or even try to make it up to the people who have suffered through it, but recognize it's the norm, not the exception. There's a macro micro example here. Trying to turn an F student into a B student is about the same as it would take to take someone who's poor and turn the middle class. In other words, the same level of energy, but scaled up. It's not impossible, but it's really hard. I don't know if you've ever tried it. So I, I've taught junior achievement for many years where I go into the classroom and I typically teach high school kids, public high school kids, success skills. I teach them um, how to run a business. I teach them finance. I teach them about investing, all of these important skills. And I have yet to succeed uh, reaching those uh, F students who are disturbing the class, who are constantly disruptive. Look, I'm not there. I'm there once a week for eight weeks, but there are teachers there every day and they haven't made a dent. 
Because at the end of the day, there are not enough teachers or social workers or public resources to make up for problems at home or problems in the community. And that's realistically where a lot of our focus has to be in helping parents be more effective, helping families stay together, because that is ground zero for success. Your family life is the first line of defense against failure in the future. And the people who have these high noble expectations of government lifting the poor up out of poverty. I think some things can be done, but we have to be realistic. A lot of it has to be offloaded to family where it belongs because I don't think there are enough resources for people to raise their own kids and then somehow miraculously fund a government that can raise other people's too. This was a great example of wielding economic power. Um, in Africa, 54 countries created a single economic block, so they have more negotiating and bargaining power with the rest of the world whose supplies they need and, and they want to trade with. It's not that different from the EU, which is an aggregation of European states, and honestly not that different from the United States, which, you know, is a stronger union, or at least in theory. But... Um, this is how you wield economic power. And this is how, on a micro level, communities can wield economic power and get the justice and get the economic assistance that they need. This is possible. Uh, any poor community has a surprising amount of buying power. And we always hear about, oh, they don't have grocery stores that sell fresh produce. Well, guess what? If the people in that community got together and acted as an economic block, they can guarantee a certain level of sales and bring almost any supermarket to their neighborhood. It is possible. And I think more people need to think in those terms because that's what ultimately gives them leverage in a capitalist society, capital. And even a lot of poor people can add up to enough value to a, a corporation or a profit-driven individual to invest in them. Same thing with startups, same things with, with all kinds of people. So we have more collective power than we realize. And African countries are realizing that. And I think poor communities need to realize that too. Microsoft is letting employees work from home permanently, forever. And I started thinking about how this might even perpetuate inequality. So imagine the highest paid profession in the most profitable industry now can work from anywhere. Those employees aren't only getting high salaries, but now they can lower their costs because they can live in some little town as long as they have internet access. So they're maximizing freedom and mobility. Everyone else isn't so lucky, especially the people delivering their groceries or their Grubhub or their Instacart or Amazon. Those people can't live just anywhere. They have to live somewhere where those jobs exist. So the rich are getting richer in a way and more stateless and less accountable because now you don't have that uh, concentration. It's no longer, hey, our company is located here and we have a certain obligation to that community. Now the company is going to be based in Cayman Islands. Their employees are going to be scattered everywhere. And who owes any obligation to any community? And how do you make that case? It's a very interesting problem. I'm not saying it's wrong. I, I think they should be doing what's right for them. But I'm also thinking about it from a societal perspective. It's still an initial thought, but hopefully one that stimulates some ideas on your end. This guy, Dan Price, who is a CEO of a company that guaranteed all of his employees 70000 minimum salary. Now, of course, he's in financial services and they have the margins to do it, but still a noble thing. He posted this. He said, um, 1948 to 1979, worker productivity up 108%. Stock market up 603%. Worker pay up 93%. 
But then since then, since 1979, worker productivity is up 70%. Stock market is up 2,200%. But worker pay is only up 12%. And he's saying corporations and workers used to get rich together. Now companies just keep the money. There's definitely truth to that. But we also have to understand why that's the case, because you can't just come to a blunt force solution without really understanding why the problem exists. So first, there's a rise of digital, which disproportionately rewards capital, because think about it. You know, uh, I think it was, was it Instagram that was bought for a billion dollars or WhatsApp? It might've been one of those. They only had like 10 employees or something, or maybe it's not 10, maybe it's a hundred, but you can have a company that generates huge value, operates at huge scale, and doesn't require any labor. And the way that startups and startup financing is structured could heavily reward just a handful of investors and the entrepreneurs who started the company. That rise of digital and that scale is unprecedented. We've never had anything that can spread so frictionlessly. It spreads very much like a virus. And Clinton's uh, fix for executive compensation actually exploded the problem. They implemented regulations that kept pay at, at a certain level. Well, guess what? Corporations are crafty <laughs> and executives want to get paid. So that launched getting paid with options, with stock options. And that's when wealth of executives skyrocketed. And you could actually see from when that policy was implemented until today, that line just shot up on the executive side. Um, the death of unions definitely did contribute. I, I think I want to do a separate conversation on unions, but uh, I do think some employee leverage is important. How to achieve that leverage may be different today than it was then. But certainly when you don't have collective bargaining power, you have less bargaining power. The exporting of skilled jobs via free trade agreements. Once again, that happened under Clinton too, where uh, NAFTA and a whole bunch of free trade agreements were signed and jobs just poured out of the country. And that's not to say there's something wrong with free trade, except you have to have a plan to replace those jobs with something else. Otherwise, you have a bunch of people <laughs> out there pissed off and voting for Trump because he's promising them clean coal forever because those are the only skilled jobs that are still available to some people. Automation is a big part of it, uh, along with outsourcing. Uh, you know, even in China now, a lot of the factories that used to have hundreds of thousands of people producing these gadgets now are being stamped out by machines. Also, the rise of the low-skill consumer economy jobs. You know, when all those skilled jobs, when they disappeared, we just have service jobs in restaurants, in retail, and now even those are going away, especially because of the pandemic. And corporate consolidation. If you want to check out my deeper thoughts on that, there's an article called Why Monopoly is the Future and We Love It. Check it out. 500 companies make up 72% of our GDP right now. That's insane. And overall, I think it's time for a reevaluation of Clinton's presidency. What felt great at the time because all of this digital technology was being innovated actually hid a lot of the problems with these with his policies. Reckless trade agreements, loosening of the lending standards and bank deregulation. That led to the Great Recession. Uh, executive pay spikes, as I mentioned, uh, his moral failings, and there's a whole bunch of other things. So Clinton has been revered and he gets to run around. He flies around in Epstein's jet. We all look the other way. It's time to really revisit historically what he meant to us, not just how he felt at the time, <laughs> especially to his interns. This guy, Matt Stoller, who I think is a Bernie kind of guy, he wrote that the Fed needs to be abolished and we need to let the stock market crash and Congress needs to replace the Fed with a congressional committee. 
I could not disagree more. As much as I dislike the Fed and it's sort of this pseudo governmental thing because it's run uh, more or less by banks, I can't stand politicians even more. I don't trust them. They're way less competent. They're dumber. They're prone to pandering and corruption. They're being bought off regularly with donations from rich people and corporations and selling access. For now, I'll take the devil we know over the one we don't. But if we get a decade or so of competent government and government service, no recessions, we have healthcare, tax rates are reasonable, there's safety, you know, whatever metrics we decide to put in, maybe I'd reconsider. Maybe it is a good idea, but certainly not now and certainly not with this bunch that's in office. Dan Crenshaw, he's the representative from Texas. Uh, he was uh, on Saturday Night Live after uh, Pete Davidson insulted him. Anyway, he just proposed a direct primary care model. And this is something I talked about in the healthcare series. If you haven't heard that, check it out. I talked about direct primary care as a way of lowering costs significantly. It pays a monthly fee, something like $100, to a doctor's office and provides you unlimited visits and all kinds of other services. The only thing it doesn't cover is hospitalization, but it's not that far off from an effective healthcare system that's affordable too. I think there's a startup called Forward. There's one other one. Uh, one is in California and one's in New York that's implementing this model. Anyway, I think it's interesting. I don't know the exact implementation in his proposal, but it's something we should look into. So a lot of people have been shaming others based on how they use their stimulus money or their unemployment money, because apparently people are buying uh, electronics and other discretionary items. Well, I've got news for you. Electronics are essential goods at this point. They're not discretionary items, even video games. I can make an argument that that's probably preventing a lot of beatings at home because <laughs> there might be parents that are uh, prone to such things and very angry that they're being disturbed in a very small apartment uh, while they're trying to Zoom interview for a job by a kid who won't leave them alone. We need to take it easy on people and hold off on the judgments because not everyone is lucky enough to be uh, sitting around watching my podcast. And you are lucky, very, very lucky. I'm against excess regulation, but we also live in a time of a massive consolidation of corporate power, of capital and political influence. And in that environment, some curbs on that power are going to be important because we're kind of past capitalism at this point. Capitalism implies competition. When 72% of GDP is represented by 500 companies, competition's not really on the menu anymore. Uh, so we've got to do something a little bit different to curb some of the power of monopolies, duopolies, and oligopolies. God, I love saying big words. So there was this uh, quote by Charles Bukowski, the problem with the world is that the intelligent people are full of doubts while the stupid ones are full of confidence. And someone else posted that he did not say that. <laughs> Apparently it's a misattributed quote. So I came up with a proposal and everyone talks about income redistribution, wealth redistribution, but almost no one, in fact, I'm pretty sure no one talks about witty phrase redistribution. Think about all of the people who are alive right now and people who've died without saying a single witty, memorable thing. Millions, maybe billions of people. I propose that we reassign all witty, misattributed phrases to historically oppressed dead people. Finally, we can remember them as we would have liked them to be. Witty, intelligent super wise. And uh, I, think that's, I, I think that's a great idea. I, I mean, of course I think it's a great idea. It was my idea. I want to do a book of inspirational quotes called Quotes I Wrote, Totes. 
and it'll be a convincing collection of quotes from forgotten tribal elders, maybe. So that way, everyone gets a shot at being commemorated by history. And what difference does it make anyway? Why not assign it to like, you know, King Tut or you know, like someone more oppressed than King Tut, someone buried like, you know, in the little tiny cavern next to that. I know someone who's building a huge Bitcoin mining operation. And this thing burns as much energy. I'm looking at the chart here. It's somewhere between Czech Republic as a country and Colombia. Imagine mining something that doesn't exist, a digital coin, because you, the way you create new coins is a bunch of powerful supercomputers have to be cranking on equations to create coins. So a lot of these miners are incentivized to do it because it's basically alchemy. They're creating money out of thin air, except it's not thin air. They're burning up forests and entire countries, basically. It's like the equivalent of a forest every few days being burned to generate some numbers on a computer. It is insanity that no one talks about this. This is the most wasteful, horrible use of energy I could imagine. And China's okay with this. And a lot of the production is being done in China because one, electricity is cheap. And secondly, China wants to keep it cheap because any outside currencies are a way to take power from the dollar and the United States. Because at this point, the power of the US is its currency and our ability to print as much as we want of it and because it's still more stable than theirs. And as long as that's the case, that is a threat to China's power. So when something like Bitcoin comes along and if it starts to pick up steam, that is a disruption China is very much interested in. So they will absolutely look the other way. And last I checked, about 50% of Bitcoin mining was happening there. So I had a theory that tech companies that go public with big losses would never have survived in other eras. What allows them to persevere, to continue succeeding in a lot of cases, is their capital advantage. It lets them acquire startups and other competitors, and it also lets them outlast the competition. Because imagine you can sell dollars for 60 cents for 10 years, which is essentially what a lot of these startups have been doing, like Uber. Uber's been bleeding cash, but there's so much cash they've raised that they're able to burn it up and still exist. And hopefully through a war of attrition, the competitors either die off or they'll acquire them until they can create a monopoly. The capital is what matters more so than the technology or the solution. And there's other variables, management and luck and how effective or ineffective competitors are, regulation, all kinds of things. But capital to me is one of the main, if not the main things that is the difference between success or failure in different eras. Prediction, in 20 years, Texas will be the US's most populous and prosperous state. I looked at the list of cities that have gained the most population between February and July, they're all in Texas. Thousands of people moving there from California and from other states. People act in their own self-interest. And when you have a state that kind of lets you do your own thing and doesn't charge a state income tax, it's gonna attract a lot of people, especially if it's got as much room. Texas is big and flat, much like my booty. Texas is gonna be a big winner here. I think. California is about 20 million or 30 million uh, larger than Texas, but I do see that trend turning and, and California is chasing away a lot of people. They've raised their taxes to a point where it's it's almost comical. You know, there's really no incentive. And now that the pand pandemic has happened, I see a lot of businesses moving out. And Hollywood, even though it's still there in name, in reality, they're filming everywhere else except for California. They're filming in Vancouver, in New Mexico, in Atlanta. They're kind of done with California, and I think the tech industry might be done with it too. I am convinced that credit agencies are intentionally tinkering with your credit score, you know, adding three or five points here and there just to get you to log in to check your score so they can try to upsell you on their service. It is so devious. And because it's your financial information, it's a little unsavory, at least to me. 
Let's talk about China for a second. From Asia to Africa, China has been promoting vaccines to win friends. In fact, I just heard that China will be offering its coronavirus vaccine, apparently it has something, to Brazil, and Brazil has agreed. So the way China is doing this, China is so strategic. They are looking at this 100 years out. They're playing chess. We're eating our marbles. <laughs> Uh, they are deepening their sphere of influence. They are building ports and infrastructure across Africa, factories too. They're trading with Latin America. They're providing vaccines to poor countries. They're selling weapons in the Middle East. They are creating all kinds of allies everywhere around the world. And we are doing nothing. And this is one of the reasons, you know, even though I kind of lean libertarian on certain things. We can't realistically live in a libertarian world that also has China in it because we have to be active participants in the world and we have to create friends and allies and do a lot of the things that they're doing to extend our sphere of influence. And I'm not talking about uh, building empires. What I am talking about is building alliances and that's what China is doing and I think China is a lot more devious. I think if we did it, we would do it in our way and hopefully just with trade and goodwill. And if you look at foreign policy in general, there's really not a lot of defending of Obama or Trump's foreign policy. And no one even tries to defend George W. Bush's because they're like, oh my God, you know, the, you, you started so many wars. <laughs> You're not even in this conversation. But tariffs, pretty speeches, endless wars. That's not a foreign policy. They're flaccid acts of the visionless. We need to build mutually beneficial bonds and long-term trade relationships. Who is doing that? We're just aggravating our trading partners now. You know, yes, we're, we're throwing some tariffs against China and China deserves a lot of it, but what's the plan? What, what is the mission here? I don't think it exists. And if it does, I, I really wish someone would tell us. We're letting the world slip away. So someone asked, why does China allow US-based hardware but not software? China only lets in the things that they can't do. Everything else that they can do themselves or copy, they'll do it. And I had this experience firsthand at American Express and MasterCard. We tried to do deals with China, but China is super devious about it. What they do is, hey, sure, you can come to our market, but you have to partner with Union Pay, which is like their official payments provider, and you have to basically give up all of your data, all of your IP, all to China. And operate with virtually no profit. So there's no such thing as trading with China because China doesn't allow you in. And if they do, it's gonna be under their rules and they will copy every single thing. They will take your IP, they will take your data and they will monitor you every step of the way. So it's never been fair. And Trump, at least recognizing the problem is great. I don't love the way we've gone about it. I think it would have been better to show strength in conjunction with Europe. I understand why he might not have done it because I think Europeans have a tendency to over deliberate and go very slow, take little baby steps. We needed something stronger and more decisive. Unfortunately, we have to do it alone. And I think we have enough leverage, but we need to have a longer term plan. This is not a plan. We, we're not very competitive in their market and they like it that way. The other thing is we have to accept that there's no such thing as an American corporation. As workforces spread out, as operations for all these companies spread out, everything is a global supply chain. Even post pandemic, there are certain things that are still gonna come from overseas and we're gonna be shipping all kinds of things overseas and we're gonna be employing people from all over the world because now everyone is virtual. Global multinationals, they might operate here, but they don't have any allegiance to the US. These are not American companies, even if they're nominally located here or were started by American entrepreneurs. They will 
please shareholders in any way they can. They will ship jobs abroad. They will sometimes hide cash overseas or hoard it from taxation. And they will supply shady regimes with their services. Because at the end of the day, that's what we've created. I don't know how we put that back in the bottle. I don't see how we do it alone. Let's put it that way. Anything we do would have to be done with other countries in the world. I don't see anyone with a willingness to start that dialogue, but we're gonna have to do it pretty quickly because soon taxing corporations or even imposing controls on them is gonna be impossible. I have this quick theory how active traders make index funds better. So if you invest in the S&P 500 through Vanguard or some other company, you're basically investing in a basket of stocks. But the history of investing, and uh, I think the majority of investing still, is through active trading. Someone, a fund manager or a personal portfolio manager is deciding what companies and what stocks to buy or sell. Same thing with bonds. But this bunch of Ivy League educated fund managers who are busy researching companies and bidding up certain stocks but not others, that affects the valuation of those companies. So if, even if you have a passive index like the S&P 500, it's weighted based on market capitalization, how valuable that company is. So all of these active traders are essentially helping determine the value of index funds. So the index is benefiting from their hard work. Anyway, I just thought it, is, it was an interesting way to think about the stock market. I've told this to people before, don't use paper checks. <laughs> don't use debit cards for purchases because there's very little protection uh, for that money. Yeah, you might be able to get it back, but you have to go through a lot of paperwork. And in that process, that money's gone. So use a credit card like a debit card. You pay it off every month, uh, don't carry a balance and you'll be fine. Or have a separate card that you use the same way you would a debit card. But recently there was a story that said, fraud has gone through the roof in these person-to-person -person payment apps like Venmo and the Cash App. Like this one woman had 166 bucks to get her through the month for her and her child and someone pulled it out of, of that account. There's a better way to do this if you do have to use these apps. It's best to link it to an account that usually doesn't have a balance and then only transfer money in when you need to use it. That way you're not having money sitting around there for people to potentially steal. It's not the most efficient method, but it's something that'll let you sleep at night, especially if you're down to your last 166 bucks. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to sign up at patreon.com forward slash McFuture to get all kinds of bonuses and to support the show. Look at me, I'm down to my last shirt. It's the same one I've worn at the end of every one of these segments. So please go do the right thing, subscribe, tell a friend, uh, sign up for the Patreon. The fate of the world depends on it. See you next time on the McFuture.